Hi, so I'm Nina Shelson. I'm a partner with Inner West Partners. We're a diversified venture capital firm. About half of our activity is on the life sciences. And I've been investing for about 16 years, initially at a hedge fund and then uh, in venture for, for the last uh, 13 years. I focus on drug therapies for high unmet medical needs, uh, molecular and companion diagnostics. And then I think partly because of my interest in the evolution of the healthcare system and also behavioral health, I have a great interest in consumer health, empowering the consumer in the changing healthcare system, and also in uh, healthcare IT and connected uh, health. I was a Stanford human biology graduate, uh, and it was that first lactose uh, gene that got me to become really, I think, a behavioral health and a, a behavioral medicine groupie, so I'm really delighted to be here. Took a bunch of classes from Robert Sapolsky and, uh, um, and benefited a great deal from that. So thanks for having me. So I have a couple of investments in infectious disease. Uh, one is uh, in part in response to methicillin-resistant uh, bacterial infections. Um, and we are seeing great progress in the clinic, a more potent uh, once-a-day shorter regimen with the hope that we would induce less resistance. This is going after a billion-dollar drug that Pfizer has called linezolid. Um, and their potential profit problem, uh, other than its eventual genericization, is the emergence of, re of resistance. Um, I also have a hepatology investment, uh, this one actually going after a host mechanism. So I guess a question that I would have is, is focusing on the bug and the pathogen um, the only really good strategy, or what we, can we be doing to focus on host mechanisms to uh, increase the resistance uh, of, the, of the human to disease, infectious disease? Um, sorry, I think better when I stand. Um, first off, I'd love to talk to you about the the, um, the next generation drug you're working on for the for the MRSA type situations, uh, and in particular how we could in the early stage of drug development start to come up with um, evolutionarily sensible ways of using the drugs which would prolong the useful life if there's a commercial driver for that, and I'd be really interested in knowing whether there is actually a commercial driver for prolonging useful life. On the issue of going on, um, using the body's mechanisms to go after things, I mean, it's absolutely the case that if you can get the pathogen cleared by immunity, that's not, never going to select for drug resistance. So if you can leave it to the body, that's a fantastic way of going. Uh, if you mean, though, that you'd be trying to generate or promote some other mechanism which perhaps the bug hasn't seen before, under those circumstances, I'd think you'd expect natural selection for, um, for evasion of whatever that thing is. So the game doesn't go away just because it's, uh, it's not a chemical. But the sort of things we've been talking about with this competition we're seeing between the resistant sensitive strains, what we are trying to play with there is the state of the body and trying to keep down the resource that that resistant bug is naturally not getting when the sensitive one's around. Try to mimic that because it's clearly evolution proof. Resistance doesn't spread on its own. It needs the drug to get rid of the sensitive ones. So we already know that whatever's keeping the resistant ones down naturally is naturally evolution proof. So we want to go after that. I think one of the lessons of all this is we should learn about the really study the situations where evolution does not occur and ask why is that? Because that's what we want to mimic. Does that answer your question? Uh, my name is Jamie Jones. I am a, a biological anthropologist and a demographer. I'm also a disease ecologist. Um, and I, I'm ultimately interested in the evolution of the human life cycle, uh, why we reproduce the way we do, why we live as long as we do, why we uh, begin reproduction and why we invest in our children in particular ways and one of the major sources of that's shaped the human life cycle is infectious disease over the course of our, our evolutionary history and so that that sort of led to my interest in infectious disease uh, I don't know if this is a question or a comment um, but where where my interest in this really lies is in the life history theory of parasites and um, and thinking about trade-offs uh, you know, fitness, negative covariances between fitnesses and different fitness components of, of uh, parasites. And I wonder to what extent um, evolution proofing can be leveraged by thinking about these trade-offs in particular. So something that we've, we've done quite recently is looking at, at the evolution of the human life cycle, measuring the quantitative genetics of different life cycle traits. And one of the things that we've found that's extremely surprising, these are hot off the press's results. We, I just presented them last week. Um, 
one of the things that we've been very surprised about is the fact that there's an enormous amount of heritability, a surprising amount of heritability for age at first reproduction in a natural fertility uh, historical population. Um, something like 45% of the total variation in age at first reproduction in this natural fertility population, no contraception, uh, is due to additive genetic effects, which given, so, uh, given the fitness consequences of age at first reproduction, the earlier you start reproducing, the more offspring you can have over the course of your reproductive span, it's surprising that there should be so much variation in this. And the reason that there's so much variation is because of these crucial trade-offs between, that we were able to measure in a quantitative genetic way, between age at first reproduction and recruitment success, the number of offspring that survive to reproductive age that a woman has, uh, and age at first reproduction and her average inner birth interval. Um, and so, you know, thinking about that, that heritability of age at first reproduction, this thing that, that, fit, that fitness is crucially uh, sensitive to, being maintained by the, the, uh, these trade-offs between other life cycle elements to which selection is also extremely strong. So, in the, in the case of evolution-proofing pharmaceuticals, uh, maintaining that, that additive genetic variation is, is sort of the idea of maintaining, you know, resist, uh, uh, um, sensitivity to, to drugs. Do, do these types of trade-offs uh, play into this logic? Yeah, so Jamie's raised uh, a lot of very serious issues there. Um, obviously, you're 20 minutes into a diverse audience, so I try to make things sound simple. I, I don't want to give you for a second a sense that this is a simple business, this evolution. We're trying to predict evolution and we're trying to shape the future of evolution. And, you know, biologists hate predicting, let alone really trying to shape the future, and especially evolutionary biologists. Um, and the only way to do it is by thinking hard about the genetic variation that exists and the co-variation, which is what Jamie's talking about, and then how selection acts on that. And I've just talked about the selection, but the, which is the bit that medicine controls totally. And then there's the genetic variation and co-variation, which is, for example, in the case of susceptibility, drug susceptibility, what else have they got as a fitness advantage or disadvantage by being sensitive or resistant? Um, in the case of the mosquitoes, what is, a, what is the price that a resistant mosquito pays in terms of, for example, later first age at reproduction or fecundity and so forth? And these are deeply important questions if you want to predict the actual trajectory of what's going to happen next. And I think uh, the take-home message I put to all of this is this is a hard science problem. And I've shown you cartoons, but the math behind this is really ugly, even the generalities, and it gets very, very, very hard to do in any sort of simplistic petri dish kind of a way without knowing those sorts of things. So if we want to know sensible things about the long run predictions for evolution, we need to know these trade-offs, how they work, and the strength of them at the genetic level. The other thing that went off in my head when you said that is that the issue about how much variation is there, you know, you're surprised about the amount of genetic variation there. I come from a behavioral ecology background, and the way you, that's to say you're trying to predict behavior evolution, and what you do there is you know nothing about the genetics, so you just assume there's a ton of genetic variation out there in which selection can act. And I live my life assuming that out there right now there's a malaria parasite resistant to every conceivable drug we could ever invent. The resistance already exists mutationally, it's already out there, and it's being lost continuously by these sort of trade-offs. So I think the genetic variation is always present. That's my default position. And then we've got to think, assuming it's there, what do we do next? So, um, you know, to me it's kind of unsurprising there's a lot of heritability around. That's, to me, almost the rule rather than the exception. One of the things that I've been troubled by in, in evolutionary medicine in general, uh, and, and evolutionary biology applied to social sciences, and uh, with a few notable exceptions, such as the person standing to my left, uh, there's a remarkable lack of attention in, in much, many of the fields to these types of, of, of mecha mechanistic details, the trade-offs, the genetic architecture, these types of things. I think that if we're going to make progress in evolutionarily informed medicine, evolutionarily informed social science, we have to actually delve into uh, the, the, the dynamics, as, as Steve mentioned, that, that we need to understand the mathematics of the dynamics of these things. And that we, we often gloss over these, and, and that's my... Yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah. Um, excellent point. Point that I think uh, Randy made also, so, so uh, absolutely. Dan Blumstein, UCLA. Um, how does virulence map on to your sort of evolutionary dynamics of uh, infection treating? If you have something really virulent and you're not going to survive anyway, it seems that should influence um, your treatment regime. I mean, your logic's impeccable, but virulence varies as well. 
Well, thanks for that compliment about my logic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the way I would handle that in the framework I've just pitched you is that one of the treatment names I had up there was make the patient healthy. And so if you've got a very, very virulent disease, which if you don't get rid of every last bug as fast as is humanly possible, then you'd be nuts not to go for that. I think there's actually rather few cases where people have demonstrated if we just took another day over the treatment regimen and got rid of them a bit more slowly, that person is more likely to die. Now, I accept that there might be such cases. And in fact, on our first paper where we proposed treating malaria patients more slowly than one might do, uh, one of the referees said that it was um, morally reprehensible. And then the rest of that sentence was, but should be published immediately. <laughs> Uh, and the morally reprehensible was the argument that any one malaria parasite left in the body has a chance of causing cerebral malaria. And so you've got to get rid of everyone as fast as possible. I don't think that's true, but I might be wrong. To me, it's an empirical question. So it, go, it factors into your decision making in those three criteria to me. Does that answer your question? I should say, and perhaps I can add, I got a phone call from somebody in, uh, in, in TB in South Africa saying, actually, we're at the point now with our TB drugs that we do withhold them from some people for the common good. So there are patients that are a lost cause. There's no point putting even more strength of selection on those patients. And those people go off to sanatoriums and fight it out with their immune systems. And this is the dark ages. Uh, Jim Glisheen, technology partners. Um, uh, to go perhaps one step more morally reprehensible. Uh, what if you did the experiment of inoculating uh, the organism with a, a still drug sensitive bug once it's got resistant bugs in it? Yes. Um, well, obviously that is something we've thought about. Um, I've got a couple of responses to that. One is that in a sense that's what we do with live attenuated vaccines. So there are situations where we give people and certainly agricultural animals live pathogens because it does generate protection. So it's, it's not without precedent. Of course, in that sense, it's working, those ones work through immune uh, enhancement. Uh, in the case of drug resistant ones, um, I think it'd be a very hard sell to anybody in the malaria community that we're gonna give somebody another malaria parasite when they're dying of malaria. But on top of that, our work, at least with the rodent models, has shown that the competitive ability, which is what it's all about, how those get on, that is predicted best by virulence. So the hotter the strain, the better a competitor is. So in our hands, at least, all of the uh, avirulent strains are very, very feeble competitors, which incidentally is a little bit of an interesting one about the natural selection acting on virulence normally. Competitive, the more aggressive strains are, have a fitness advantage in terms of competition, so might be expected to spread in the world. So in the specific case of malaria, I wouldn't be up for it. And in other diseases, uh, you know, we, we kind of are already, and so maybe there's some scope for playing with that. I still think there's a lot more scope with a lot less controversy uh, about thinking about trying to use our drugs better or coming up with better targeted drugs. Uh, the regimen strike me as an issue which is, you know, less controversial. I'm Tom Carlson from UC Berkeley, Department of Integrated Biology, and I have a question here related to resistance. And if you take artemisinin alone, it's one, it's one molecule, okay? Resistance develops. If you add a couple drugs together, it reduces the likelihood. Uh, how about thinking about taking Artemisia annuum, the plant used for 2,000 years at least in China to treat malaria, making a standardized extract that's concentrated that includes artemisinin as well as a variety of other molecules that are closely related and use that to treat these because I think resistance would be much more difficult. Yeah, so I, I skimmed over that general issue of combination therapy. There's no question that if you can combine in the same product active compounds which have the right properties, then you can get evolution proofing coming about because it's much harder to mutate resistance to two or three or four different genes or targets at the same time in the same bug than just one. So combination therapy done correctly has to be the right way to go forward. And in fact, if you do combination th therapy correctly, it might allow you to ease up on how you then use the drug subsequently because the chances that the resistance is gonna appear de novo is reduced. So a lot might allow smart things. The trick is to know what to combine, what sort of combinations, and it, I don't know in the case of the plant itself whether there's sufficiently different molecules in there that are actives that a resistance mechanism to the artemisinin wouldn't also apply to some of those others. 
and as you, by the sound of it, know, the artemisinin has these fantastic pharmacokinetic properties that it's immediately removed from the body, which from an evolution and resistance management point of view is great. The selective pressure gets in there and then it's gone. There's no hanging around. It's fantastic. The ideal combination therapy for artemisinin would actually be some other drug that had the same properties. At the moment, it's paired up with drugs with very long half-lives, which means we have combination therapy for a couple of days and then extensive monotherapy for days or even weeks afterwards. Combination therapy is clearly evolution-proof in the case of HIV drug regimens. And it's really interesting that that's a place where the right combinations were worked out empirically, put together, and they used very, very aggressively as combination therapy. And that was done without any evolutionary biology. It was done by physicians uh, and, and sort of conventional microbiologists empirically working the situation out. And I can't help but think that's because that patient dies if the evolution goes wrong. So where the patient and the physician have exactly the same thing in common, and it's an evolutionary problem, we get serious evolutionary science happening, whatever they called it. Uh, where it's not the patient in hand, but it's you guys, the next patient and the next one and the next one down the line, when that happens, we don't get any evolutionary science at all. Short-termism dominates. Hi, Cami Samuels. Uh, and I'm, I'm on the board of a company working on MDR gram-negative drugs. And when it strikes me as you were talking that when we at the company talk about resistance, we talk about it as if it's digital. Either somebody's got resistant bugs or somebody's got wild type. And I'm curious how common in the clinic you've got this mix yeah. that you modeled in the yeah. mice. Uh, <clears throat> so again, you know, 20 minutes, you don't get the full spiel on that. Um, so for those of you not in the business, what I showed in the experiment was a high-level resistant parasite and a fully sensitive one. So that is very binary. The high-level one is the one we really care about. That's the one that causes the drug to fail. The intermediate level one steps on the way, don't cause a drug to fail uh, because enough drug and you can kill those. So the intermediate steps and all of the gradations towards full resistance aren't dangerous per se, except in the fact that they can lead to the high level resistance. So they can be evolutionary stepping stones to the high level. But I think my argument still holds into those situations because we're trying to reduce the probability of that last step. And so if my different types of regimens would generate lots more of those intermediates, we need to ask, what is the fate of those intermediates? And does it increase the likelihood of a step to high resistance compared to the disadvantages you get from overwhelming chemical force designed to remove all of the sensitives and all of the semi-resistant ones? It's a balancing act. And in the mathematics, you can see that the optimal position is slightly changed. But the general argument that there's these two opposing evolutionary forces sure doesn't go away. Hey, one last question. Uh, evolutionary medicine, the word medicine, in fact, captures the imagination that you may be able to intervene. The bugs, of course, don't think, uh, how do we help out or hurt men? They're just trying to survive on their own, and we are as well. Uh, uh, so so the, the idea is to understand how we are adapting or maladapting to not be able to respond to what we're doing, and the bugs, of course, are adapting or maladapting to the interventions that we are doing as well. Uh, in the end, though, uh, uh, the, the, the conference, perhaps for me anyway, is, is how do we modify or modulate or control? And in this instance, we're talking about antibiotics. Uh, Jim, Jim back there said, what about we throw in more of the bug? But you know, there are other possibilities, right? Do we uh, 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 electrically, you know, activate it and neurostimulate the vagal nerve, you know, as 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 another out of the box thinking or whatever, what what have you? But but in the end, the the process is to try to understand how over a couple million years we have adapted to various situations and how do we harness. Uh, whatever already physical capabilities that we have to to uh, address these maladaptions that we're not able to fight off currently, and so so uh, besides antibiotics and combinations thereof and new new innovations around antibiotics and other stuff, but I don't know if this is an actual question or again rhetorical, but if you can uh, think of or just leave it at it as it is that uh, is there anything else outside of uh, uh, drugs, for example, or other things. Could Perhaps, I maybe yes, build on that to, to turn it into a question? We've seen just through the behavior of modern society a lot of changes in vulnerability to disease that has a lot to do with what we're doing to interface with the pathogens, either in our gut microflora or in our environment. 
would you comment on sort of the hygiene hypothesis as it might relate to not just infectious disease, but autoimmune disease, neurological yeah. disease? Yeah, I mean, and I, I, for me, this is, um, that specific issue is a question of trying to consider when you're, how should we treat patients? And we've got those three criteria I said, making the patient healthy, not infecting others, and not driving resistance, that we should take a holistic view to that, a broader view. That includes the patient's long-term health and disrupting the patient's microbiota by going after every last one of our sensitive target pathogens, but incidentally killing large number of commensals. That strikes me as nuts as well. And so there's another reason for trying to ask, do we really need to go after every last bug in the system? Um, but to take your general point, I, I think we should also be thinking about, and um, there's a huge amount of behavioural issues here, how do you get the infection in the first place? How do we stop that person being passed on? You notice that Indian village resistance management list that I put up did not include giving the person a bed net to go home with. Okay, so imagine that person that does have parasites in them that are resistant. They're going to go home, take the drugs, follow the course, and drive that resistance through the village. If you gave them a bed net and you got the little kid to go and make sure they're sleeping under a bed net for the next 30 days, even if they produce resistant parasites, they couldn't spread on in that village. So the behavioural change issues here strike me as being really, really important. Same with hygiene in hospitals. You know, a really critical issue in the surgical wards is this hygiene, and you can circumvent a huge amount of this evolution if there's no transmission. In the antibiotic that I'm developing, our lead indication is skin-to-skin -skin structure infections and a lot of the resistant pathogens are infections that have resulted from behavioral things, either injection drug use, uh, homelessness, uh, bar fights are very common vectors for cellulitis and, and the like. And so those are etiologies as well. And maybe I could just add, also add one other comment to your comment. I, I mean, I do take your point that thinking about the body as an evolved, it's got lots of mileage in this. I mean, really interesting, no question. To me, the issue of antibiotic resistance and what the bugs are going to do in the next year and the next five years, that's in itself a very interesting applied evolutionary biology problem, predicting the future of those guys, which we shouldn't lose sight of. We can do some really fantastic things just at that level, as well as all of the additional stuff. And the science is complicated and rudimentary. Well, let's go have a round of applause for Andrew, and we'll uh, just uh, continue the conversation. <laughs>